what I'm going to talk about today is the story of how the sans serif evolved uh, into the tr first true alternative for text typography since the Roman and Italic types of the 15th and 16th centuries. Uh, it might surprise you, despite Shelley's very generous comments, uh, to know that much of the material I'm going to show you consists of original research done by little old me. Um, well, this was a bit of a surprise to me, too, because I'm no historian. Um, I first started studying the history of letter forms while I was doing a master's degree in typeface design at the University of Reading um, toward the middle of the year when our history class got up to the 19th century. I was astonished to discover that the very first sans serif in type only appeared exactly 200 years ago this year, in 1816. 1816. Uh, somehow I'd never really thought about this before. I had just assumed that even though sans serifs weren't really a big part of Latin typography until the 19th century, surely they must have existed before then. Uh, I mean, we certainly think of the sans serif as a sort of modern type style, uh, and we associate the forms of the grotesque in particular with the 19th and 20th centuries, but it never occurred to me that sans serif types hadn't actually been around in some form for a great deal longer than that, especially given that sans serif letter forms, um, not type, but letter forms, have actually been around much longer than serif ones. So this first sans serif typeface, uh, William Caslon's two-line English Egyptian of 1816, uh, is quite well known. In fact, <clears throat> the 200th anniversary of its appearance this year is even being marked and celebrated in various corners of the type world because that's how we type nerds roll. Um, so we'll look at it in a few minutes, uh, but basically it's a simple, bold, and sort of clunky but elegant typeface consisting only of uppercase letters and cut only in one size. Um, and although Caslon's Egyptian was indeed the first sans serif to appear in type, and by a good 15 years at that, it doesn't have a lowercase. And without that, and for several other key reasons we'll talk about later, it can't really be considered the true progenitor of this third text style, in addition to the Roman and Italic. So when I started looking into this question, <clears throat> trying to connect the dots, sorry, one sec, um, and figure out how these forms of Caslon's uppercase sans serif might have evolved into the myriad styles of sans serif type that dominate the graphic landscape today, um, in particular Helvetica, which is arguably the world's most ubiquitous Latin typeface, serif or no serif, um, I was then even more astonished by what I discovered was a near complete lack of scholarship about the early history of the sans serif in type, <clears throat> and especially about its origins as a viable text style, and especially in comparison with the volume of words that have been written about the origins and development of its companion styles, the serif Roman and Italic. What did exist was an extraordinary small book called The Nymph and the Grot by James Mosley, who I was extremely fortunate to have as my history lecturer at Reading. Um, which essentially tells the life story of the sans serif uppercase, but only in lettering, and only up to the point that this first uppercase sans serif typeface appears in Caslon's specimen book in 1816. Um, and aside from a few books that uh, focus only on individual parts of the story, a few brief articles and some short chapters in books on broader subjects, the closest thing to a complete study of the early history of sans serif types is a 1960 article by a woman named Phyllis Handover, I like to call her Phyllis, um, called Letters Without Serifs, uh, which unfortunately is quite flawed and inaccurate in a variety of ways, which I won't go into here. Um, and that's literally about it. So I started looking into it myself, and that turned into this research project and eventually the dissertation for my master's degree. Um, who knew you could get a master's degree in sans serifs, right? Um, so after Caslon's Egyptian, um, most of what was known was that the 19th century produced a morass of anonymous and quotidian jobbing and display faces, out of which ultimately rose several clearly identifiable new sans serif styles in a relatively short period uh, in the very late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, there was the grotesque, typified by Venus and Accident's grotesque around that time. Then the American Gothic, which was essentially, to my mind, a genre unto itself, pretty much single-handedly created by the extraordinary Morris Fuller Benton uh, for uh, ATF. <clears throat> then there was the humanist sans serif, which originated in the work of Edward Johnston and Eric Gill. And finally, the geometric sans serif, early examples of which were Paul Renner's Futura and William Addison Dwiggins' Metro. But the 80 years of development between Caslon's Egyptian and Accident's Grotesque, the typeface that would ultimately be reinterpreted as Helvetica, was basically a black box. Now, 
In some ways, I can see that this relative lack of history is somewhat understandable. Um, the genesis of serif Roman type during the Renaissance essentially defined what the Latin printed word would look like, uh, pretty much to today. It's also a lot easier to study because there were so far fewer type founders in the 15th and 16th centuries. But this disparity in the literature still stunned me because if the Renaissance era Roman and Italic perhaps crystallized what literary language looks like, the sans serif is what contemporary language looks like. It's the language of commerce, of design, of the everyday. In fact, even the notorious historicist, I can't believe I got that out, notorious historicist, historicist. <laughs> Why did I put a tongue twister in this? Anyway, <laughs> even the notorious historicist, Stanley Morrison, uh, has stated the 19th century invention of the sans serif lowercase was, quote, the most novel and permanent contribution to letter design that had appeared on the printed page since the Aldine Italic of 1501 but it would seem that very few scholars have agreed with him. Anyway, despite the lack of academic interest in the subject, we know these didn't spring up from nowhere. So without further ado, let's try to find out what happened inside that black box. So first, a bit of the backstory. Let's look at what we do know. Uh, Unserifed Latin uppercase letters have actually uh, got a long and familiar history, which has been very well documented. Um, but I'll summarize it for you. Um, as I mentioned, the story of their early development in ancient Rome and the process by which they first appeared in type more than 300 years, 300 years after the first Roman and Italic types, is beautifully told by the historian James Mosley in his book, The Nymph and the Grot. It's a bit of a long story, but it's important, so I'm gonna summarize it for you as quickly as I can. Um, so unserifed majuscule letters have actually been around for millennia. Uh, in fact, as I mentioned earlier, they've been around longer than serifed ones have. The alphabets from which our Latin alphabet developed, uh, such as Phoenician, Etruscan, and Greek, were essentially monolinear and without serifs. In fact, the very first serifs only began to appear in Greek inscriptions around 334 BC. <coughs> Pardon me. So what we're looking at here uh, is an example of earlier unserifed Greek lettering from the fifth century BC, which is set in the Stoikodon style, which means that the letters are aligned both vertically and horizontally, forming a kind of grid. Um, I don't think you can read it in both directions, but it looks like you can almost. Um, it's like a Greek crossword. Um, anyway, as many of you know, uh, the notion of modulated stroke weight or variation from thick to thin uh, within letter forms is said to have arisen in Imperial Rome in the first century AD, so about 400 years later uh, than what we were just talking about. Um, the most famous examples of this are the majuscule letters you see here from the Column of Trajan, and now, of course, familiar from movie posters everywhere. Um, however, the earlier Roman letter uh, from the time of the Roman Republic, which is roughly up to the first century BC, so about 200 years before the Trajan column, uh, was more directly derived from the Greek capitals we saw a minute ago. Uh, and because it was attempting to imitate Greek visually, it resembles it much more closely. Um, so it's worth mentioning here that ancient Rome was the first of a series of periods of classical revival, which ultimately harkened back to ancient Greece <clears throat> sorry, ancient Greece is a model, philosophically, politically, and aesthetically, um, and along with it, the unserifed forms of its letters. This pattern is going to become extremely obvious and important in the next few minutes. Um, so the Republican Roman letter that you see here, and this uh, is an example of unserifed Roman Republican lettering from the British Museum from about 80 BC, this becomes the prototype for a time of later Latin uppercase sans serifs. Um, there were serif Republican letters as well, but their serifs tended to be more like little wedges, um, much more secondary to the letter shapes than they become in the imperial letter, where they're a much more integral part of the whole shape. And of course, it's important to remember that at this point, the Latin alphabet consisted only of uppercase letters. Um, the later style of imperial Roman capitals, like the ones we saw on Trajan's column, would only come to be combined with a lowercase, which was based on the 8th century Carolingian minuscule, um, a millennium and a half later during the Renaissance, uh, which of course also happened to be the next period of classical revival after ancient Rome. Hopefully we can all remember our art history. Kind of comes in handy here. Um, so once the Roman imperial letter took hold, mm -hmm. and then as the Middle Ages dawned, the sans serif disappeared from Latin lettering quite thoroughly until it was rediscovered for a time during the Renaissance, when antiquity again became a touchstone of European culture. Uh, it wasn't a major presence during the Renaissance. Um, since the Middle Ages, lettering had become completely dominated by broad-edged writing instruments, which don't exactly lend themselves to monolinear letter forms, um, but it was a quietly persistent one. 
So this is a fairly typical example of what sans serifs looked like during the Renaissance. Uh, you can clearly see a relationship to imperial Roman capitals here, um, but this quintessential Renaissance form is definitely taking on an identity of its own, tending to be more condensed, more high-waisted, and slightly modulated in stroke weight. Uh, in fact, to my eye, looking almost more like it derives from the early Roman rustic hand that you see here than the Roman inscriptional tradition. Um, you do see more clearly Republican style sans serifs during the Renaissance as well though, uh, like this one from Ptolemy on a map from 1477. I think that's a really lovely example, so elegant. Um, so James Mosley's account has the sans serif disappearing pretty much after, completely after the Renaissance, not to reemerge until the neoclassical period, beginning in the late 1700s. But there actually do seem to be many examples to be found starting 100 years earlier in the mid-late 1600s. <clears throat> so this might just be a sideshow and not the main narrative, but it's still part of the story, and I think it's worth looking at a few examples. <clears throat> and it does fit with his main narrative to some extent, as this period coincides with the advent of another moment of classical revival, which is the Enlightenment. Um, curiously, though, despite the fact that by this point the Latin alphabet finally does most assuredly have a lowercase, all of the sans serif examples of this period still feature an uppercase only. And many of them look rather curiously medieval as well, um, which is odd given the sort of whole repetition of classical um, forms that we're talking about being the impetus for these being revived. Um, so this one is a gravestone from Gosforth, England in 1628. And I think we could probably all agree that that certainly looks more medieval than classical in character. Um, <clears throat> ditto this one, a cast metal plate, also from England in 1689. Um, something to point out here is the double curve on the leg of the uppercase R in repaired on the first line and in mayoralty in the center. Can everybody see this okay? Hopefully it's clear. Um, this is something we have not seen in a sans serif R before. They're generally either fully straight, possibly with a slight outstroke like that, or they're curved only at the top, as in the Renaissance version, and then coming down in a diagonal. So uh, <clears throat> that's something to note, because we'll see that again. Uh, the cursive form of the Y in mayoralty, at the end of mayoralty in the center there, um, is also a bit curious, not something I've seen before. And here are some more starkly monolinear sans serif letters on this fantastic lintel stone from Wensleydale, England in 1691. If this came up on eBay, I would totally buy it. I think it's so pretty. <clears throat> but sans serif letters in this period were not just found in Europe. Matthew Carter very kindly provided me with some examples, of which there are apparently many, um, of sans serif lettering on New England gravestones, like this one from Massachusetts in 1672. Again, uh, you can note the medieval character of the A um, and the curved stroke of the Y. Um, but this inscription contains a clear reference to the Roman letter as well, substituting the letter V for U in February on the last line uh, and using interpoints instead of word spaces as the Romans did. And I also just have to point out the awesome the ligature at the top, on the top right. Um, and here's another one, also from Massachusetts, but over 50 years later, uh, from 1727. Um, again, with this kooky medieval style A with a bar on top. Um, and uh, I just love all the contractions here. There's definitely nothing expert or fancy about this carving, but I find it thoroughly charming. Um, so this leads us to where James Mosley's account picks up again with the neoclassical period of the 18th century. I just wanna make sure I didn't skip anything. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Just gonna indulge in a lozenge. I tend to lose my voice when I do this talk. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, hopefully you won't be hearing the lozenge more than my voice. Um, so in very broad strokes, the neoclassical movement um, began as a reaction against the excesses of the Rococo age, directing cultural values back toward the perceived purity of antiquity on every level again, as in the Renaissance, philosophically, politically, and aesthetically. This movement and the Enlightenment before it also had a significant effect on the appearance of letter forms, which we'll look at briefly in a bit. Um, so James Mosley tells the story of how the sans serif began to reappear in the work of the very prominent English neoclassical architect, John Soane, who some of you may have heard of, um, under the influence of detailed drawings, which were made by his teacher, George Dance II, when Dance traveled to Italy as a young man in the 1760s. So drawings like this one, which depict the lettering inscribed on the temple of Vesta at Tivoli, which it just so happens was built during the Roman Republic. 
These meticulously measured drawings betray an interest not only in the letter forms, but also in their very classical underlying geometry. You can actually see tiny marks made by the stand of a compass in the center of the letters O and G. I don't know if you guys can see that from where you're sitting, but these letters are not sans serifs per se. They actually have the tiny little wedge-shaped stroke endings, typical of the Republican serif letters that I mentioned earlier. But they're also similar to those letters in that they're almost completely monolinear, and in the sense that the serifs are almost incidental to the letter shapes. From a distance, you can actually hardly see them. Can anybody see serifs on those from where you're sitting? Yeah? Okay, but they're small, right? <laughs> Uh, my point stands. Um, so uh, the young John Soane later not only made careful copies of his teacher's drawings, but then himself went to Italy to study and make drawings of the architecture as his teacher had done a quarter century before. Then a few years after his return to England in 1780, he began to use a quite distinctive uppercase sans serif lettering style, both in the labeling of his drawings and most importantly, in his proposals for the inscriptions on the buildings themselves, such as the one you see here, um, his elevation of the facade of the Norwich County Jail, drawn in 1789. And you can see that he's not only using these sans serif letters on the title of the drawing at the bottom uh, in his kind of fancy label, but he's actually proposing to use these sans serif letters for the design of the inscription above the door as well, where it says the county jail. And again, you can see he's got the interpoints, I mean, on either side of the word, but still you know, B instead of U, et cetera. <clears throat> and as James Mosley points out, the letters used by Stone in this context, unlike those on George Dance's drawing of the Tivoli inscription, are unmistakably sans serif in character. They're less geometrically constrained, and they're more organic and informal, but they still very much possess the feel of Roman capital letters. As I said, the V instead of the U and the interpoints. Um, but most significantly, these also very closely resemble and form the very first sans serif type, which would be issued some 40 years later by William Caslon. A um, couple of details worth dwelling on for a moment. <laughs> Glad to see you're all paying attention. I put these things in for a reason. <laughs> um, so a couple of details that we, uh, I think it's worth dwelling on for a minute are two deviant forms that Soane's lettering makes rather interesting and persistent use of. Neither the double curved leg of the R, so it going like that, nor the doubled back vertical stroke, um, sorry, vertical stem on the G, where it goes like that, are Roman in origin. But you might remember that double curved R from the metal plate in Cornwall that we looked at a few minutes ago. The construction of the R by this point is easy enough to comprehend as a form that was typical of the modern faces of the time. But the treatment of the G is far more curious. Um, the lack of a horizontal bar is consistent with the inscriptional model. In fact, we saw such a G in George Dance's drawing of the Vesta inscription. The G what, you know, was sort of a semicircle and then a straight line that ticked up from the baseline. But the G being constructed in such a way that the main round stroke curves upward from the baseline and then sharply doubles back to form a stem is a whole other matter. Again, this would appear to betray the influence of the modern face, maybe. It's as though Sohn has perhaps perceived the hairline weight horizontal bar of a typical modern face G, which would be very, very thin, um, and rest on top of the heavy vertical stroke, not as a structural element, but as a serif, and thus removed it. But what makes this truly interesting is that actually, as far as I know, no modern face up to this point actually had a G constructed in that way. Um, the G of Baskerville and later Dido, which you see in the upper left, both featured a small spur at the corner where the lower round stroke straightens to become the stem, as you can see there beside the R. Um, but it's not until the much later modern faces, which you see in an example of in the upper right, perhaps even the fat faces of a quarter century later, that the stem of the G is constructed in the way that Soane's appears to be in 1789, doubling back to the baseline. A possible contemporary source for a construction like this is the script form of the uppercase G, which you see in the lower right. Um, but heaven knows why Soane would incorporate such a feature into this style of lettering. Maybe it was just a peculiarity of his own handwriting that carried over into his lettering. Uh, the only other precedent for this kind of construction that I'm aware of is the late unsealed pre-Carolingian form you see on the bottom left in those 5th century rustic and early unsealed hands. Um, but again, I can't begin to speculate as to how this might have found its way into Soane's otherwise essentially classical lettering. Anyway, if it seems like I am paying undue attention to a minor curiosity here, please have patience because we will be seeing this uppercase G again. So... <clears throat> From this point forward, through the last quarter of the 18th century and into the first decade of the 19th, 
uppercase sans serif lettering begins to appear in a wide range of contexts. And although not all of them are architectural, they do seem to be consistently associated with antiquity. Uh, these uppercase sans serifs generally looked quite similar to what you see here, either shaded like this one or plain. Um, now, the vogue for this letters of this style, sorry, for letters of this style in Europe coincided with and was certainly helped along by the Napoleon-inspired Egyptomania of the time. And as they became more popular and entered the canon of sign writing, James Mosley cites several references from the period to this new style of block letter, which was becoming known as Egyptian. Egypt, of course, having been one of the three major ancient societies, Egypt, Greece, and Rome, interest in all of which was at a high during the neoclassical era. Um, and as you can see, these Egyptians were very much in the style of Soane's lettering. This is an engraving, uh, but this particular shaded style makes its way into type very early, oddly always in smaller sizes, and persists throughout the century. So what all this brings us to, nearly two millennia after its appearance in lettering, is finally the Latin sans serif's migration into type in William Caslon Jr.'s 1816 two-line English Egyptian which you finally see here. Now, it's like 20 minutes after I first mentioned it. Um, uh, Two-line English, just for your information, is about 28 point. Um, so though they're often spoken of as somewhat clumsy and unresolved, and granted or maybe a little unsure of themselves, Kazan's letters also have a quiet forthrightness and simplicity about them, I think. And most importantly, <clears throat> they clearly evoke the inscriptional heritage that we've been talking about all this time, which the choice of Egyptian as a name places beyond the shadow of a doubt. You can see it in the geometrically circular O and C, uh, in the narrow proportion of the S, and in the overall variety of letter widths, as well as in the straight leg of the R, which notably is more closely related to the typical Roman form uh, than the one in John Stone's lettering. Um, and another possible reflection of the inscriptional her uh, heritage implied by this first sans serif type from Caslon is the fact that it consisted only of an uppercase. But you probably knew I was going to say that. Um, so. That takes care of the uppercase, at least to this point. <clears throat> but we still don't have a text style to talk about here yet. Where is the sans serif lowercase? Finding precedence for it up to this point uh, has been kind of an exercise in grasping at straws, but I'll show you what's been found so far. <clears throat> this image of an inscription from 1748 found in a grotto in Stourhead, England, is the namesake of James Mosley's book. Uh, again, it's called The Nymph in the Grot. Um, it has a lowercase, um, but rather than being a true sans serif as we imagine them, its stroke weights are so heavily modulated that it's essentially a serifed modern face with its already barely there serifs removed. There's none of the implied monolinearity, which is the other hallmark of the true sans serif. They're very rarely actually monolinear, but there's a sort of, um, yeah, implication or, or, or uh, effort towards monolinearity that's kind of inherent to them. Uh, you can even see little serifs on all the S's in the bottom two lines, uh, and as well on the uppercase A's. So it does look fairly intentionally like the serifs have been removed, but I, I'm not 100% certain that, I mean, it's not consistent, and I'm not sure that they couldn't have maybe worn away. Who knows? So either way, as sans serif lowercases go, this one is non-committal at best. Um, one can say something like the opposite about the lowercase in this 1765 New England gravestone inscription. It's pretty clearly monolinear, but in this case it has tiny vestigial serifs. It could almost be the lowercase of those Republican letters that we saw earlier uh, transcribed by George Dance in his drawing. Um, and where those tiny serifs don't appear, it kind of seems like they just were skipped rather than willfully omitted. Uh, the final and only convincing example of a pre-typographic sans serif lowercase is again one cited by James Mosley um, in the maps and drawings of William Gell's 1810 book, The Itinerary of Greece. Not surprisingly, a work referring to antiquity. Um, most of the examples in these illustrations look like the top one here, uh, with an implied stroke modulation that's achieved by a second echo stroke. I don't know if you can see that from the back, but um, there are these sort of double stroke le uh, construction letters. Um, and it kind of pulls them away from being monolinear. But in one instance, uh, there's no denying that we're looking at a fully intentional sans serif lowercase in the word heap of stones in the bottom image. Um, these solid monolinear and decidedly unserif letters drawn by William Gell in 1810 may still be the earliest true example of a sans serif lowercase. But as an isolated example, and as handsome as convincing as these lowercase letters are, they seem unlikely to have had any bearing on the look of the upper and lowercase types that would begin to be cut some 20 odd years later, um, and sadly are probably best regarded as a bit of a one-off. This is unfortunate because 
the letters we're going to see would have probably benefited from having these as a model. Um, unfortunately, very few lettering or sign writing manuals from this period survived to tell us otherwise. Um, and if anybody knows of any, please let me know because I'm on a constant search for them. Um, and after searching through several large collections of ephemera from this period, I was quite surprised to find no other examples. Though, of course, it's entirely possible they're out there and I just haven't found them yet. Um, but from the research I've done so far, it seems that not only was Stanley Morrison justified in describing the sans serif lowercase as an invention of the 19th century, uh, it appears to have been a purely typographic invention at that, which I should point out is highly uncommon at this stage. Most type forms up to this point are based significantly on an existing lettering model, which then makes its way into type. So it's a pretty curious thing, and I'm um, constantly in search of uh, things to prove me wrong about that. So the only other possible pre-typographic models for the sans serif lowercase are really just theoretical ones. Prior to the 19th century, three processes for rendering letters came into use, which, even if they didn't directly shape the typographic sans serif lowercase, certainly may have suggested or at least helped to prepare people for the idea of monolinear letter forms. Uh, the engraving buren, the lithographic crayon, and the pencil are all inherently monolinear drawing tools, <clears throat> which require stress to be consciously added to letters if desired rather than imposing it on them as the broadened pen, the pointed pen, and the flat brush all do in their different ways. And all three of these new writing tools came of age in the years before the return of the sans serif. And although copper engraving had been in use for centuries by this point, in engravings of the late 18th century, we begin to see quite frequently uh, the signature of the engraver and other incidental pieces of text written in a style that has no modulation of stroke weight at all, like these examples. You can see in the word Florence on the left and in the words J pass sculpt on the right, um, there's just no effort to make these look like they have any kind of uh, thicks and thins. They're just unabashedly monolinear. Um, also this example from a fragment of a 1799 drawing by the very well-known satiric artist James Gilray. The lettering in the bottom right appears to be not only effectively monolinear but also without serifs. <clears throat> now, although these may seem like insignificant examples, they seem to occur frequently enough as to have become an accepted practice around this time. So the narrative we've been following up to now explains how the sans serif re-entered our graphic vocabulary, culminating in this, the first sans serif type, which we saw a few minutes ago, cut by William Caslon IV in 1816. Happy 200th birthday, Caslon, two-line English Egyptian. Um, but like Gell's lowercase, Caslon's type seems to have been something of an isolated incident. There's apparently no evidence that this type was actually used in print until much later, or at least no such evidence has yet been found. Um, although it was shown periodically by the future owners of the foundry after it left Caslon's hands in 1819, it clearly had little impact. It would be 16 years before another sans serif type would appear in a founder specimen. And the 19th century sans serif that is, as it emerged in 1832 was an altogether different beast from Caslon's two-line English Egyptian and its classical lineage. A sans serif type with this particular kind of pedigree would not appear again for another 100 years. Um, so to comprehend this new breed's formal rather than conceptual origins, we don't need to look nearly as far afield as ancient Rome. <coughs> Uh, no doubt the most significant influence on type at this point, both technically and visually, was the arrival of the Industrial Revolution. Everything was changing, and typography was no exception. The mass production of goods, uh, enabled by the myriad technological advances of the day, necessitated the creation of a mass market for those goods, and the advertising industry was born. Um, the, the urban landscape became dominated by posters and littered with handbills, and in order to keep up with the level of graphic impact and novelty coming from woodcut printing and the fledgling technique of lithography, new types were needed, uh, types of a kind which founders had never before produced. <clears throat> These new graphic demands necessitated the liberation of display typography from the dominion of the book and essentially forced the invention of several major and countless minor new type styles. These had to be big and bold in order to grab the attention of passersby, and increasingly, they also had to be novel to make every message stand out from every other message. Sound familiar? <laughs> um, such types needed to speak the emphatic new visual language of commerce. The quiet and venerable voice of culture would not do. So the first type style which appeared to address this need within the first decade of the 19th century was the fat face, which you can see in the top two lines of this poster uh, in italic on the top and then Roman caps below it. 
Um, it's essentially a modern face with a contrast between the weight of its thicks and thins radically exaggerated. Uh, this seemed to do the job for a time, but it wasn't long before the desire to pack ever more ink into every square inch of type resulted in the design of the slab serif, which is what you see in the rest of the large type on this poster. <coughs> the first slab serif was initially shown as an uppercase by Vincent Figgins circa 1817, uh, and it was followed by a lowercase around 1821. Uh, this is a sample from an 1824 specimen. Um, so both the fat face and the slab serif were immediate runaway and continued successes. They permeated the specimen books of founders throughout England, Europe, and the United States at an incredible pace and stayed there, uh, remaining staples of 19th century typography for the better part of the century. In this context, it's a little wonder that Caslon's Egyptian never quite caught on. Uh, it was too big, too bold, and for the time, too starkly unadorned to be used in book typography. But at the same time, it was too small and most importantly, too quiet for this new kind of display work. Um, it simply lacked the density to stand up against the intense blackness of the fat faces and slab serifs of the time, um, a blackness that was needed to provide sufficient contrast with the ornamented types, which were multiplying in number and variety by the day <clears throat> and which had come to completely dominate display typography. I kind of wish I could do a second master's degree all about these because they're so amazing. Um, <clears throat> so the 19th century sans serif, as it would appear in 1832, could not be accused of having this problem. It shared the slab serif's blackness, but because its forms were so much simpler and its counters weren't enclosed by great blocky serifs, uh, it was much more immediately legible and could achieve a kind of density and impact that just isn't possible with serifs getting in the way. Um, perhaps because of this, it was also initially most often cut in a far more condensed proportion than the fat faces and slab serifs of the time, which were fairly squarish. Um, so uh, its bareness and density and height meant that it was able to shout louder than any other style and made the sans serif the ideal poster type. Now, aside from the obvious difference in weight, <clears throat> the most critical difference between Caslon's Egyptian and this new breed of sans serif lay in its internal proportions in the relative widths of individual letters. So as we've seen, Caslon's type shared the elegant classical proportions of Roman inscriptional capitals like the ones you see here. Um, these aren't Roman inscriptional capitals, but they're based on that model. Uh, these are from an old style typeface um, whose uppercase proportions are based on that model. Um, the letters vary in width from quite narrow to quite wide, as you can see, because the forms were based on the simple geometry of the square, the circle, and the triangle. Um, the variety in letter widths that this produced also carried through the lowercase, as you can see in this cut of Garamond, um, and as it was developed through the 15th and 16th centuries. Um, and this kind of variation in the widths of letters uh, within one typeface remained standard practice right up until Baskerville effectively invented the modern face in the middle of the 18th century. So although his types are generally referred to as transitional, they actually introduced the two defining features of the modern face, <clears throat> a vertical as opposed to oblique angle of stress in the relationship of thicks and thins, and of greater relevance to this discussion, a much more uniform approach to the relative widths of letters. As you can see here in the second lines, uh, in both the upper and lower case sections, compared with the old style above, the widths of letters start to become much more similar to each other, more rationalized, more regular. Um, and both of these qualities reflect the effect of enlightenment rationalism on letter forms. Another tongue twister. Reflect the effect of enlightenment rationalism. Um, then the fully modern types, uh, which followed on from Baskerville, took both of these qualities to their logical extremes, from those of the Ditos through Bodoni, and into the various ubiquitous modern faces of the 19th century. Um, you can see an example of the proportions here in a contemporary cut of a Dito in the third lines. Um, in addition to the extreme stroke contrast, notice how differences, sorry, how the differences in letter width in the top lines um, of each section have been almost completely erased in the third lines, and how radically different a pattern this creates in a line of type. Um, so these proportions were then inherited uh, by their tough new cousins, the fat face and the slab serif, but most importantly also by the newest and toughest member of the family, the sans serif, as it appears circa 1832, which as I've said is an altogether different beast from Caslon's very civilized Egyptian. So one more quick thing I should mention before we get into looking at the types is the quagmire of nomenclature. Um, this new style comes to be described in an insane cacophony of ways, and I won't go into the details or provenances of those now because that could be actually literally a whole other talk. Um, but suffice it to point out that of the 15 variations that you see here, the nine at the top before the space are all just from England alone. 
Um, the other six are shared among the other main countries of uh, the sans serif development, the US, Germany, or the states which would later become Germany and France. Uh, so without further ado, let's look at the types. Finally, right? Um, so as I mentioned, the first sans serif types after Kazan's Egyptian arrived with a bang 16 years later in 1832. Now, I'm not sure what was in the water that year, but no less than four different foundries on two continents showed their various brands, all in uppercase only, likely for the first time, all in that same year. Um, in England, William Thorogood's Fan Street foundry showed their compressed, heavy, grotesque in one large size only, but with two related styles, one plain and one incised. I'm just showing the plain one here. And Vincent Figgins brought out his Sans Serif in four different sizes, ranging from about 96 point all the way down to 10 point. Um, I've listed the actual sizes on the captions, um, but as I talk about them where it's relevant, I'll just give you the point size equivalent because most of you probably don't know how big a two-line great primer is or a five-line pica. Um, and I probably don't either. <clears throat> so these were all uh, of a more square proportion and generally lighter in weight than the thorough good example we saw previously. Um, in fact, the two seem to be almost entirely unrelated visually, uh, though thorough good in the previous slide shows so few letters, it's hard to compare them to any great extent. Um, it is interesting to note that they have opposing approaches to the leg of the R, that most revealing of features. Um, Thorogood uses the modern curved leg, um, and Figgins use, here uses his own slightly awkward take on the more classical straight variety. Um, the most critical form to mention here, though, is, of course, the uppercase G. Um, Thorogood doesn't show one in this year, but the G shown by Figgins in his two smaller sizes should look very familiar. It's that same strange form drawn by John Stone nearly 50 years earlier. <clears throat> now, although visually Figgins' types owe very little else to the Roman inscriptional tradition, I think we can agree these are very much children of the industrial age in every other respect, um, the presence of this G makes the ultimate source of these forms very clear. Um, and although alternatives to this form of the G did arise and proliferate quite early on, this one holds its own and persists quite widely for the remainder of the century. Um, established wisdom on the birth of the 19th century sans serif has regarded these two English founders as the definitive originators of the genre. But interestingly, my research turned up two American examples from the very same year. Um, across the Atlantic, and seemingly independently, the Boston Type and Stereotype Foundry released a lightweight Gothic, similarly squarish in proportion to Figgins, uh, but in a text size only, 10 point. It's a curious little face and was a surprising find. Uh, it's certainly more elegantly cut than its English counterparts. Its proportions do hint at the classical, although they stop rather short of it, um, and the weight is even lighter than that of Kazlan's 1816 Egyptian. Um, and the different treatment of the G here is also worth noting. It's the opposite of Figgins's style, this one having a horizontal bar, but no vertical stem. Um, so as possibly the earliest example of the American usage of the term Gothic to describe a sans serif in type, this hardly fits the image of compressed blackness that that word conjures up. Um, Though in all likelihood, this term was in general used to describe sans serif lettering before it entered type, much as the term Egyptian is thought to have been in England, most likely a term from the sign writing trade. Um, so the second American example from this same year, still in 1832, is less surprising. Uh, it's called Gothic Condensed, and it appears in an 1832 specimen of the New York foundry Connor and Cook. Uh, it's certainly more gothic in character than Boston's offering and only slightly more elegant in form than the English examples. Uh, it's shown in three large poster sizes from 96 to 288 point. So a lot of what we're looking at, some of them will be metal types, but at this point uh, a good number of them are probably wood types because they're so large. Then in 1833, England's Blake and Stevenson so show their sans serifs uh, in a total of five sizes, three somewhat ornamented and two plain. Um, and this is the plain type. It's about 120 point. Uh, these are a little less condensed than Thoroughgoods and very black um, with quite tiny counters on letters such as the <clears throat> A, B, and R. They're also an early example of what becomes a quintessential trait of 19th century sans serifs, the abrupt thinning of horizontal strokes in tricky areas to allow the overall mass of the letter to remain heavy without the counters completely filling in. Um, this will typically be seen on such letters as the uppercase A, E, B, and R, and the lowercase A and E, um, letters that are sort of divided in half usually. But in this case, somewhat awkwardly, only the A really receives this treatment, maybe just slightly the H. 
you can see the difference in weight between the middle strokes of the A and then the E, R, and B. It's a little indecisive at this stage. Um, so then the year 1834 saw a major development, the first attempts at a sans serif lowercase, one from each side of the Atlantic. Uh, so Thorogood, who we heard from in the very first slide, um, in addition to having augmented his grotesque selection with five new sizes all the way down to eight point, and now including an uppercase G, which is lacking a horizontal bar in the sewn style, also showed a lowercase with the 84 point size. Um, but he doesn't seem to have been entirely convinced of its potential. Um, it was shown as communicate in 1834, communion in 1848, and common in 1868. Uh, one is inclined to wonder whether he actually got the whole alphabet. Um, and the rest of the English market seems to have shared Thorogood's skepticism because although this was the first English sans serif lowercase to be shown, it would also be the last for nearly 40 years. Um, Phyllis Handover, Phyllis, quipped that um, Thorogood may have demonstrated with this attempt that a legible sans serif lowercase simply wasn't possible, thereby discouraging anyone else in England from trying to make one. Uh, be that as it may, uh, Johnson and Smith of Philadelphia, on the other hand, showed a very condensed lowercase in two sizes in the same year. And it was to be the first of many from the United States, which, along with Germany, from this point forward, becomes the locus of the sans serif's development until much later in the century. Um, and this is something that has been kind of, uh, was a, a bit of a surprise as I started doing this research and became a bit of a mission for me, because the previously written history of sans serif letters has always been very Anglo-centric, very focused on uh, England being the, the source and um, kind of locus of, of the sans serif, and I found that to be very much not true, <laughs> um, as you'll see. So um, this was not, however, the most auspicious beginning. I try not to impose my own subjective judgments on these things too much, but for me, these faces really put the grotesque in grotesque except that they're called gothic, but you know, whatever. Um, these letters seem to range in quality from the clumsy to the awkward to the downright freakish, uh, by which I think you know I mean that E. Um, Thoroughgood's lowercase, though not exactly elegant, did fare a little better, though of course it was also on the clunky side. But either way, it's been done. The sans serif lowercase has arrived, warts and all, and there is no going back. Um, the year 1834 also brought the first sans serif italic. Well, more of an oblique, um, among the 17 all uppercase sans serif types shown by Caslon and Livermore in 1834. Uh, these are two of the larger sizes. Um, and you can see an example of a very similar uh, italic uppercase um, in the uh, pop-up case at the back um, from a different source, but it's a very similar cut. Um, so in the ongoing narrative thread that is the uppercase G, um, it's worth noting here that the presence of both um, Sorry, worth noting here the presence of both a horizontal bar and a vertical stem, as well as the wedge-shaped bottom of that stem. Um, this is a strategy borrowed <clears throat> from the slab serif style, which adds a bit of richness to the otherwise staunchly blocky, sorry, staunchly blocky rendering of sans serif forms thus far. Um, and as the style matures and becomes less simplistically and dogmatically monolinear, it's the kind of thing we begin to see a lot more of, but not for some time yet. This is just sort of a little hint of it. <clears throat> okay, so then on the heels of those first two lowercase offerings, several others appeared quite quickly in the years that followed. In 1835, the New York foundry <clears throat> of White Hagar, sorry, I need another lozenge. <sighs> My throat's just not cut out for public speaking. I used to do a radio program and it was just all croaking all the time. <clears throat> Right, in 1835, the New York foundry of White Hagar came out with this poster-sized Gothic condensed that was nearly identical to Johnson and Smith's from the previous year, which we just saw. <clears throat> uh, and like the Connor and Cook example that I mentioned earlier, this also featured sus suspiciously similar text in its line showings, finished bountiful, as distinct from Johnson and Smith's finished beautiful. But it's not a carbon copy. The, the first assumption when you see those kinds of similar settings from two foundries is that one foundry is just copied or possibly bought, but most likely copied, the, uh, the face from the other foundry, but they are actually different forms. Um, there are subtle differences from the Philadelphia original in the larger size, and the smaller size is quite appreciably different, um, although sadly it's not much more pleasant to look at. Um, significantly, uh, 
1835 also saw the first European sans serif, complete with a lowercase no less, from a foundry uh, called Gottlieb Haase Zona of Prague. Um, and this is a foundry which seems to have been largely serving the German market, um, although German was apparently very, very commonly spoken in Prague during this period as well. And when I say Germany, I mean Prussia and the other states that would become Germany in 1871. Uh, Germany as such didn't exist at this time. Uh, in any event, it came in the form of this large poster type, which is about 84 point, um, probably wood. And very tellingly, it uses Thorogood's English term. It's called grotesque, spelled with a Q-U-E, not a very Germanic spelling. Um, there's a definite resemblance between the forms of this typeface and those of its namesake. The lowercase e is particularly telling. I don't know if any of you guys recognize this from that early uh, grotesque from Thorogood. But uh, this is clearly an original creation as witnessed by that extraordinarily wacky non-descending double story G in the third line in the word Königsborn. Um, it sort of looks like you could use that as an ad for like an optical store or something like that. Um, <clears throat> also worth noting uh, is the S. Its shape with those pothook-like terminals bears a definite resemblance to the uppercase S of Figgins' 1832 sans serifs, which I'm sure you guys can all totally visualize right now, right? Um, <laughs> I'd flip back there, but it's too many slides. Um, and this would become the typical German form for quite some time, even though it did actually originate in England. Finally, yeah, okay. Finally, uh, the year 1837 brought two slightly more accomplished looking offerings from the United States, both also in wood types. Um, the, I know, I never get the pronunciation of this right. I think it's Debo Foundry showed this extremely black and compressed upper and lower case face, which takes the slit-like counters and tight spacing of the style to an absolute extreme. And given these characteristics, I think it's surprisingly well handled and quite charming. It also reminds me of something you might have seen in like the 1980s. I don't know. I think it's pretty awesome. Um, <clears throat> and then from the New York foundry of George Bruce, a face that is somewhat lighter in weight and thus even more elegant, especially the ingenious approach to the bottom curve of the T, which enables the spacing to appear more even than a conventionally curved bottom stroke would because it pushes the letter next to it further away, um, while maintaining a bit more character, clarity, and finesse than a purely straight T would have. They always just look really strange in text. So this is a quintessentially American form, and so is the treatment of the S in both of these examples. Uh, it's very different from its European counterpart that we were just looking at uh, in the much more monolinear character of the stroke and in the pure horizontality of its stroke endings that mirror the very horizontal one in the E. So <clears throat> this marks roughly the end of the first stage in the evolution of sans serif types, um, particularly the lowercase. Of course, new faces continue to be cut and sizes continue to be added to existing ones. Uh, but the initial burst of invention starts to taper off around this time. Looking at them as a group, um, there are a few things worth mentioning. Uh, first, there's no getting around the look of these early types. Uh, apart from a few examples, the upper and lower case sans serif of the 1830s is by and large not such a pretty sight. Um, our natural inclination is to assume that these forms look unresolved because they are, that they stand crudely at the beginning of a linear process of refinement. But I think it's important to ask whether this is in fact true um, and to consider whether they look the way they do by design and not because the people who made them simply couldn't do any better. In fact, we know that this is clearly not the case. Every type catalog of the period shows a huge array of ornamented types that are nothing short of virtuosic, both in design and in execution. And the use of the term grotesque is another indicator that this was a conscious style rather than an unsuccessful series of attempts to conquer the monolinear serifless letter form. Granted, in these forms, we do see some evidence of struggle with simply making a bold condensed sans serif work. Anyone who's a type designer in the audience is gonna know that. But it's also interesting that despite the presence more than a decade earlier of wider and more resolved forms in the slab serif that could have been used as a model and very well might have been in the case of later grotesques, the only sans serif lowercases that were attempted up to this point were of the bold condensed variety, the most difficult kind to resolve and one for which there really was no precedent. Um, so this may have been because initially the sans serif was needed to contrast with other types as we saw an example of earlier in the style of the day and this wouldn't have worked if the sans had followed the slab too closely in form. And maybe because the sans serif did go through a process of collective refinement later on in its life, we're justified in perceiving these early forms as crude, lesser versions of the later ones. But it seems to me that this later refinement likely happened because the style caught on and began to be adapted for different uses which motivated its refinement and not because it was intended to perform that way from the beginning. Second, 
uh, it becomes apparent that the story of the early sans seraphim type essentially takes place in three countries, England, Germany, as it existed at the time, and the United States. We see occasional contributions from other countries, but overwhelmingly its development appears to have occurred just in these three, or largely in these three. So we can only speculate as to why this is, but there are a few possible obvious reasons. The simplest is that these three were the most industrialized economies of the time, especially England, and all three had major printing and type founding industries, driven by major publishing industries, which drove the need for new types. Um, England was the seat of the neoclassical revival, which brought these forms back into the graphic vocabulary, as we now know. Uh, so we know why it caught on there. <clears throat> as to why the lowercase had no life there, until much later on, handovers quip about thorough goods ungainly lowercase aside. Um, this is likely because the, initially the sans serif is very much a display letter. And at this stage, the English tradition of display typography is, by and large, still a classically inspired all caps tradition. Um, as you can see, there would typically be precious little lowercase, if any, on posters such as this one, or on shop signs, title pages, etc. Germany, on the other hand, had a clear use for the lowercase in display settings. One rarely, and with very good reason, sees black letter set in all caps. And as for the United States, <laughs> sorry, um, sometimes it's late at night, you're making these slides, you get a little punchy. Um, if you'll forgive the cliche, the pioneering spirit of this newly independent country no doubt heightened the appeal of anything novel or contemporary looking, and especially rugged. Uh, maybe the sans serif both helped to graphically cleave the present from the past and could be made into something uniquely American. Either way, throughout the 1840s, the sans serif repertoire in general continues to expand, uh, new types tending to become smaller in size, lighter in weight, and less condensed in width. Um, so because my focus here is the evolution of the sans serif into a viable text type, my concern is mainly with its development as a full upper and lower case style, and not so much with its many all caps and ornamented variations, though there were certainly a wonderful great many of these. Um, with regard to its development into a text style, very little happened in the 1840s though. Um, for whatever reason, most of the new faces were uppercase only. So the next real leaps forward in the process began in the 1850s, roughly 20 years after the first sans serif types were introduced. They were two parallel developments which seemed to take place, at least initially independently, um, in Germany on the one hand and in the United States on the other. On the German side, uh, the starting point for this next stage is with one of the foundries we saw a lower case from in the 30s. In 1847, Prague's Gottlieb Hazazona, um, who had that crazy double story G that, were, that was um, just didn't descend below the baseline, they showed the first upper and lowercase sans serif in a smallish size, uh, which is unspecified, but appears to be about 18 point. Um, in fact, at this point, they are still the only European foundry I've found that have shown a lowercase at all. And this single cut appears unnamed, just numbered, and isolated on a page of ornamented types. Um, although it's still quite condensed, it's far lighter in weight than any other upper and lowercase style to date. So its forms are generally more rounded and open, but are still a bit awkwardly rendered, um, as is the relationship of the very heavy uppercase to the lighter lowercase. Um, but the stroke ends of the E and the R both possess a subtle inward curve um, that we haven't seen before. And this is a feature that becomes utterly characteristic of the first wave of German upper and lowercase sans serifs roughly 10 years later, as well as the much later English ones. This showing though is the solitary example of that style for about 10 years. Um, so it's significant for that reason. Okay, detour. In the 19th century, typefaces often follow the pattern of new styles originating as display experiments and then working their way into the plain types. And consistent with that, right now we have to take a little detour through some ornamented faces to understand the next formal shift in the development of the German sans serif. <clears throat> so our first stop on this detour is actually an English type from a year earlier than that previous one from Prague we were just looking at. This is Vincent Figgins' 1846 two-line pica rustic. That's about 24 point. Now, Despite having said that the sans serif lowercase had no life in England in the 1840s, and this is true of plain types, um, it does seem to have found a startlingly accomplished resolution in this ornamented face whose conceit is to be constructed of twisted and bent logs. Um, according to the type historian Nicolette Gray, this style derived from contemporary wood engraving, so these forms may owe more to a lettering artist than to Figgins. But regardless, ironically, this is the most articulately rendered sans serif lowercase we've seen so far. Um, you know that... <laughs> 
<laughs> that adage about if you want if you want something fast, give it to a busy person. It's like this is how you make a really good <laughs> sans serif lowercase. You make it out of twisted and bent logs instead of just black and white. Um, so anyway, it's significant here because its letter shapes appear to be translated almost verbatim into another style of ornamented type uh, in Germany that we'll see in a minute. And from that into the beginnings of the early German sans serif text style. Um, so this ornamental rustic style definitely traveled to Germany <clears throat> and can be found in many specimen books. But more importantly, its influence can be found in a quintessentially German style, uh, the upper and lowercase rounded shadow display types of a decade later. So this brings us to our next stop on the detour, um, briefly leaping forward a decade into the 1850s to look at this new rounded shadow style. Um, so as far as I've seen, this was first shown by Karl Mayer's Dresler Shagisarai of Frankfurt in 1857. So we're really leaping forward quite a bit. Um, but it rapidly proliferated throughout many founders' specimen books. It's not too heavy in weight, kind of normal in width, shown in small sizes from eight to 14 point, and most importantly, it features a quite confident normal width lowercase. <clears throat> Again, before we've ever seen one in a plain type, even though it's now 1857. Like I said, the 40s were quiet. So um, although it's less condensed and not constructed out of bent logs, the similarities between the forms of this typeface and those of the rustic are considerable. There's the way the sort of hook-shaped terminals of the lowercase a, e, r, and s curve subtly inward. There's the same bulbous bowl on the lowercase a, in the same tightly enclosed counters on the lowercase e and s. So there's the rustic, and there's the rounded shadow. Then within two years, uh, no less than three German founders released extremely similar normal width upper and lowercase plain sans serifs in relatively small sizes, all called grotesque. We're seeing them all here at their largest size, which is roughly 14 point. Um, so we're still in the late 1850s, and this is a little confusing chronologically because we're going to have to leap back. But uh, in 1858, <clears throat> Carl Mayer, who brought us the rounded shadow we just looked at, shows his text size grotesque just a year later in four sizes up to 14 point, which is shown in the top section. Uh, J.C. Bauer's Bauer Shagisarai, also of Frankfurt, shows theirs in 14 point only in the middle in Latin. And then the next year, Edward Hanel follows suit with a similar, although slightly more monolinear style in the same four sizes as Mayer, and his 14 point cut is at the bottom. So I'm sure I don't have to point out how incredibly similar all these are. In fact, if I hadn't told you they were three different typefaces from three different founders, I'm not sure you would have thought so. Um, they were still too bold to be used for regular text setting. Uh, in fact, by 1859, Bauer had renamed his versions Halbfeta Grotesque Modern, Halbfeta translating roughly as semi-bold. But they were a very clear first step in that direction and established a fundamentally early German sans serif style. Um, so also notice the nature of Bauer's showing, as I mentioned um, in the center. It's not just a paragraph of continuous text, but it's in Latin and complete with FF and FI ligatures. These were clearly beginning to be thought of as text types, even if they weren't quite there yet. And although they've clearly struck out on their own, the relationship of these forms to those of the rounded shadow and rustic styles is to my eye quite clear. And I hope you guys can see that too. Um, one significant difference is in the lowercase a though, uh, the bowl of which has lost that kind of bulbous shape and now slopes downward, more like the prog face from a decade earlier. And here are two slightly larger sizes from Bauer's renamed Halbfeta series of 1859 or semi-bold. Um, by far the most crucial shift which has occurred here is that in all three faces, we see the first use in a sans serif of the single story lowercase g, famously to become a staple of German sans serif types and much later of other nations as well. Um, the single story sans serif g is generally thought to have descended directly from the black letter lowercase g. Now, why it enters the sans serif vocabulary at this point in time, one can only guess. But it's interesting that its emergence coincides with the arrival of the first uniquely German sans serif types. Um, it's probably not a coincidence. It's also worth pointing out, just because it's been a few minutes since I've mentioned an uppercase G, um, that the one shown here is not the more typically sewn inspired kind um, with only a vertical stem, but the combination of wedge shaped stem and horizontal bar first shown by Caslon. <clears throat> and the uppercase R in all cases has the same arched leg found in the uh, rounded shadow face from which these seem to derive. Um, Mayer and Bauer's faces in particular 
uh, both feature an overall subtle modulation of stroke weight. Uh, and not just in those junctions where we expect it, so that they're, they're there to allow the letter to still appear monolinear by pulling weight out where it would um, accumulate um, with printing. There's actually a kind of deliberate stress in these uh, typefaces. This would be shared by other German sans serifs to follow and help to distinguish them from the American style which began to develop around the same time. So with that, we can step out of our rustic inspired detour and we jumped ahead to the late 1850s so that you could see the direct lineage from that rustic ornamented style. Uh, and now we can shift backwards a bit to take a look at what was going on outside Germany in the 1850s. Um, so by the late 50s, when that <clears throat> German sans serif lowercase was just getting started, the American one, in large sizes anyway, was already quite well established. Alternatives to the extremely compressed and bold uh, types of the 1830s and 40s had begun to be offered by several foundries. Um, by 1853, New York's Bruce and White foundries, among others, both offered types which were still very large and very bold, um, but they were getting considerably less compressed uh, and their shapes were becoming ever better resolved and more internally consistent following the examples set by the Bruce and Debo faces of the late 1830s. Um, so in fact, by this time, the Bruce foundry had expanded their early Gothic condensed, um, that rather nice face shown earlier as Festo, into a family of at least six different sizes. Um, as early as 1849, wood type manufacturers Wells and Webb were offering one of the first normal width upper and lower case sans serifs, simply called Gothic, um, in at least four sizes. And even though these are still huge bold types, uh, they represent a critical point in the sans serif's development because for the first time they're approaching more text friendly proportions, if not weight. Um, this same typeface shows up in a specimen of the white foundry five years later in 1854, which also contains a very early extended upper and lower case sans serif, their Gothic extended. And there's um, in the pop-up exhibition at the back, there's examples from the mid fifties, I believe of similar cuts to these from a different foundry. Um, in 1855, Connor and Sons, also of New York, um, showed an amazingly prescient, lightweight, straight-sided, extra-condensed Gothic in one size, uh, 24 point, I believe. Um, and at this point, we still have yet to see a sans serif lowercase of normal weight and width. So this one seems both quite accomplished and quite ahead of its time. Now, despite the fact that all caps faces of normal weight and width had been gaining popularity for a number of years in all three countries, um, here's a quite accomplished German one with apologies for the wobbly image, uh, which was shown by Hainel in a range of 11 sizes in 1856. Um, it's only in the later 1850s that such types begin to be given the same kind of real estate in American specimen books as their bold condensed counterparts. But once they do, they positively explode onto the scene and with a companion lowercase hot on their heels, this appears to be the defining moment in the sans serifs development. Uh, so here's another normal weight and with all caps face, this time again from the white foundry of New York. Um, and here's the first plain rounded upper and lower case sans serif I've found. Uh, it's a pretty friendly looking face and only one large size, again from <clears throat> the white foundry's 1858 specimen book. And even though this is also a poster type, I'm showing it because it contains a normal weight and with lower case, which is probably looking quite unfamiliar at this point because we haven't seen anything like it. And you'll see why I'm showing this to you in a minute. Um, so in much the same way as the years 1832 to 36 saw a burst of invention, which with the true arrival of sans serif types and multiple foundries all coming out with their respective versions in the same brief period, the early 1860s brought with them a parallel kind of explosion. <clears throat> During this period, two American founders and two German founders, at the very least, all showed their own variations of the first real upper and lower case sans serif text types. Are you ready? <laughs> Um, they were all of normal weight and width. They were treated as serious families in a range of sizes from roughly five to 24 point. And in them we see for the first time both the forms of the prototypical 19th century grotesque and the seeds of its myriad 20th century permutations. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, uh, I present you with the first true grotesques as, we, as we've come to think of them. Uh, and as far as I can tell, the earliest of the four founders to come out with a proper grotesque text type is not German. Uh, and we already know it's definitely not British. Uh, it came from the White Foundry of New York. Uh, 
So this specimen of their new upper and lowercase Gothic types is dated 1860. But based on the frequency of the year 1862 that you can see in the showings, it's more likely to have been cut in between those years. Uh, but for a number of reasons that I won't bore you with, I'm confident that it was definitely cut before 1862. And based on the gradual growth of this family, as well as the range of normal with lowercase experiments in the various specimens from the white foundry we've just been looking at, where you can sort of see this idea germinating, um, failing future evidence to the contrary, it seems almost definitive to me that this is in fact the first of the bunch. Um, when the full 1860 to 62 specimen book, which these showings come from, was released, the Gothic family was shown in seven sizes, from a tiny five point up to 24 point, each with a lowercase, as well as a complete upper and lowercase related bold version called Gothic number no. one, which you can see in the lower half of this showing in the same range of sizes. Um, these faces, to my eye, can easily be seen to relate to those large, bold, wider types shown by Wells and Webb in 1849 and then by White in 1854, although on a completely different scale and considerably more refined. In particular, uh, the lineage of the lowercase a seems quite clear. These were the first to be shown in this new normal width proportion and possibly the first examples with a teardrop shaped bowl since the 1830s. Um, in the new text sized face, however, the tail of the lowercase a curiously now features an eccentricity that is consistently, though also somewhat strangely, um, applied throughout both this family and the related bold version, the presence of a corner where one would normally find a curve. You can also see this in the top of the F, the bottom of the T, and the tail of the Y. Can you guys see that from where you're sitting? Super strange, right? Um, uh, as well as, <clears throat> sorry, uh, the fact that this appears on several characters and in the bold as well, for better or worse, is very interesting evidence of a conscious effort to design a cohesive and unique family. And in fact, this may be among the earliest related bold designs, um, parallel weights designed and released together. Not, for instance, a Clarendon cast on the same body as a Roman it was meant to coexist with, which was the norm in this period of the 18th century. Um, these quirky square forms turn up in many catalogs for a while until they're finally whittled out later in the century, um, which also belies the initial influence of this funny little typeface. In fact, a recent-ish release that you might have seen called Proto Grotesque from the French foundry production type is based on these forms, um, but as they discovered them, recut in an 1883 specimen from the Stuttgart foundry Bauer and Company. Um, <clears throat> but perhaps the most distinctive characteristic of this new grotesque, uh, which we really haven't seen yet, uh, perhaps because of the smaller size they're being cut at, um, is the abrupt and extreme thinning of curved strokes as they approach acute angled junctions, which you can see in the lowercase a, b, d, p, and q, and the h, m, n, r, and u, while the rest of the letters remain essentially monolinear. Uh, this is a truly genre-defining feature, which I'm sure you will all recognize from the many later grotesques that we all know and love, uh, and this is the first time we've seen it. Uh, there are a few inconsistencies among the caps and numerals, <clears throat> especially that persistently revealing G, which sometimes appears with a bar in the smaller sizes. Where is it there? In the word engraving, you can see a different G. Um, and then the larger sizes in Gothics, it's the barless kind. Um, but these seem to be left over from the face's previous life as a kind of somewhat inchoate collection of uppercase only types. Um, and of course, I can't help but point out the form of the G that's still with us here as the sans serif takes its great leap forward. Um, so likely the second group of the, sorry, second of the group to spring to life, um, our next family comes from Frankfurt's Dresler Shigiserai. Uh, the same one that was owned by Carl Mayer, which was taken over in 1859 by Ferdinand Flinch, who I think has just like the zippiest name in typeface design. Um, the specimen book it came from um, is dated 1861, but the sheet on which this family itself appears shows the founder's address as being one which they only occupied after 1863, so we can confidently say that this showing comes after that of Charles White. You can see why it's such a project to do this research, because like accurately dating these things is often a nightmare. Um, like White, Flinch added these new upper and lowercase grotesques to an existing family. In this case, those narrower, bolder faces produced by Mayer five years before in the late 50s, uh, which we looked at a few minutes ago during our detour, and which you can see in the two smaller sizes here. Um, they make conspicuously strange bedfellows. On the full specimen page for this family, uh, Mayer's earlier faces are shown as the four smaller sizes, 
um, with their straight-backed lowercase a, single-story lowercase g, uh, uppercase g with a horizontal bar and slightly condensed proportions, just as they were shown in 1858. And then there's the flinch contribution, shown in the two larger sizes here, from the words summer down to the bottom. Um, this was also cut in a total of six larger sizes from 18 point and up. And these feature a double story lowercase g, a lowercase a with a curving tail, as well as a teardrop shaped bowl, a barless uppercase g, and then the abrupt stroke modulation, which are all now familiar to us from the faces of Charles White. So although the direction of influence here seems fairly clear cut, I find these types from Flinch to be particularly lovely examples and in many ways handled with greater finesse than those of the White Foundry. Um, especially distinctive uh, are the pronounced wedge-shaped stem of the lowercase b, um, and this just like marvelous lowercase a. It's just got so much character. Um, the lowercase g is also quite elegantly cut, though it's not shown here, so you just have to take my word for that. Um, also interesting is that Flinch's forms are less monolinear overall than those of white, especially in the numerals. Um, the soft vertical stress in these types is clearly reminiscent of the faces we saw from the other Frankfurt foundry, Bauer's larger, larger Halbfeta types in 1859. And several of the forms make me wonder if a more modulated face, perhaps a Clarendon or even a modern face, might have been used as a model for this lowercase, but not in the W, obviously. <clears throat> and of course, you know what I'm gonna say about this letter. It's still following us around like a pesky shadow. Um, this bold version was a little complicated to date and quite befuddling for other reasons I won't take the time to go into here. Um, but it appears to have come from another New York foundry, James Connor's Sons, in 1863 or 1864. Uh, the specimen this comes from appears to be rife with electrotyped copies of the white and flinch faces. In some showings, they're even intermixed with each other. But this bold is the one showing that hadn't yet appeared anywhere else that I've seen so far, so I'm including it. Um, the caps are pretty idios idiosyncratic with their significantly thinner horizontal middle strokes. Um, and that becomes, of course, another quintessential trait as the 19th century grotesque evolves. The curly tails of the lowercase a and y are also quite distinctive. Um, but whether these are an original design or simply copied from another founder whose specimens I just haven't yet examined remains to be seen as James Connor was the person who will go down in infamy as having perfected the process of electrotyping matrices, the use of which for copying typefaces he heartily condemned later in life. But this specimen book may, shall we say, predate his uh, change of heart on the matter. Um, and then the final, although not necessarily last, contributor to this critical stage of development is the Leipzig Foundry Shelter in Giesecke. Uh, the specimen book that these showings come from is dated 1862 to 67 and shows a large number of sans serifs and styles quite different from this one, ranging from somewhat bold and condensed to bold and extremely condensed. But the ones we're looking at right now are their normal width style, the grotesque Schrift mit Gemeinen, and Gemeinen means lowercase. Uh, what we see here is a family of a very similar kind to that shown by Flinch. Um, like Flinch, in a, uh, a, of a total 10 sizes, the smallest four are in that same purely German style of the late 1850s that we saw in our detour. And the larger six are of the possibly more American style. So again, we see the same dichotomy between the straight back lowercase a and single story g in the smaller older sizes, and then the double story g and a with a tail and teardrop shaped bowl in the newer larger ones. These are similar, but by no means identical to the faces shown by Flinch. And the specimen does include a note positively insisting that the types have been poured from, from original matrices. Um, the dating of this particular sheet is a little tricky and still unresolved. Um, so it's possible that these types could predate those of Flinch, but because the specimen book contains sheets from as late as 1867, it's also entirely possible that they're later. Bit of a question mark. Um, and I just wanna add that this past week, uh, your fellow Bay Area typophile, Stephen Coles, who's in Berlin at the moment, so unfortunately isn't able to be here tonight, uh, dug up what might be two further American examples of very early lightweight grotesque text types that may add to this part of the story. Um, as he found them online, I have to locate hard copies of the specimens that these appear in and look at them in person to try to determine whether they're dated correctly and do ind indeed fit into this part of the narrative. Uh, but they're a potentially interesting addition because although they clearly relate to some of the other styles we've just seen, they're also lighter in weight and feature the first non-lining sans serif figures that I've seen in grotesques of this period. So stay tuned on that to be continued. Um, regardless, <clears throat> the notion that the moment represented by these four iterations of the grotesque, which I'd argue we see for the very first time clearly articulated in these four families, would in fact come to define the 19th century sans serif, 
is reinforced by the fact that what follows it reads like something of a postscript. Um, for the most part, the contributions to the grotesque which take place over the remainder of the 19th century are minor variations on and additions to this newly established style. Um, they refine its basic forms and provide models for the components of the major sans serif families of the early 20th century, but those essential forms remain largely unchanged from here on in. There are, however, still a few significant developments, and it, it's at this point that the story finally shifts back to Britain. That took a while, didn't it? <laughs> As I said earlier, um, all cap styles had continued to flourish in England since their introduction there in 1832, with almost every foundry developing <clears throat> permutations ranging from the bold and condensed to the light and extended, and every possibility in between. In a full range of text and display types, um, and in many ca cases far more refined actually than their German and American counterparts. Um, <clears throat> Yet still, the only sans serif lowercase to emerge from England thus far had been Thorogood's abortive attempt of 1834. <clears throat> but in 1870, this suddenly changes. And oddly enough, the process begins with a lightweight condensed italic. One more lozenge should get me there. We're almost there. <laughs> um, you can see it in the middle of this slide um, from H.W. Caslon and Company. Uh, but although this was the first lowercase of its kind, Partial credit for its appearance has to go to the Fan Street Foundry, who showed an almost identical uppercase only italic face in the previous year, which you can see at the top. Uh, it's as though Caslon simply produced a lowercase to match. Interesting here is the choice of an obliqued double story lowercase a instead of the more cursive single story form in the showing below, which is from V and J Figgins, um, also in 1870. It's similarly proportioned, <clears throat> but utterly different in feel. Uh, it's more of a pseudo sans serif italic. It's far more script-like in character than we'd expect a sans serif italic to be. Um, it even features ball-like uh, sort of swells at its stroke endings, implying the flow of ink from a pen and a greater degree of stroke modulation than the caps. But amazingly, those caps are, again, virtually identical to the ones from Fan Street in the top line. Type founders, man. <laughs> they just love ripping each other off. Um, I guess it's the sincerest form of flattery, right? Um, so for a little sweet revenge, here's the Fan Street Foundry's very graceful 1874 answer to what a lowercase to match their italic caps should look like, which for my money is actually the loveliest of the bunch. However, it wasn't until 1873 that Britain produced its first new upper and lowercase sans serif Roman types since 1834, just shy of 40 years later. Um, but it seems like waiting out the growing pains of a new style paid off for the Edinburgh Foundry of Miller and Richard in an 1873 specimen that you see here, they show not one but two styles. Um, in the upper showing is sans serif number one, a lightweight condensed face that's <clears throat> the upright companion to their sans serif italic of 1870, and very similar to the ones from Caslon and Fan Street that we've just seen. And in the lower showing, their lovely normal weight and width grotesque number one. These are both clearly descendants of the genre defining American and German faces of a dozen years previous, but they're less eccentric and far more elegant than their clunkier forebears. And in the case of Grotesque Number no. 1, um, they're clearly cut for proper text setting. Um, the next British entry of this decade is Caslon's Doric series, which this bit of copy makes clear was no special initiative of theirs, but merely a response to an overwhelming demand for a sans serif lowercase. Can you guys all read that? The first sentence says, many have been the applications we have received for Doric or sans serif lowercase, and we have been induced to commence the series so as to supply the want thus indicated. It's pretty entertaining to read the whole thing, actually. Um, <clears throat> but in the interest of time, uh, here it is, uh, another truly lovely, elegant English grotesque. And again, shown in a literary paragraph rather than just graphic single line showings, making the intended use of these types abundantly clear. And here's a final gorgeous and quintessentially British example from about 1880. Uh, these are two of the sizes in 12 and 24 point from the slightly later grotesque number no. six family um, by Stevenson Blake. Um, as late in arriving as they are, all of these final basic iterations of the genre, the mature British style, if you will, still manage to make a real contribution to it, I think. Um, they've been refined to an extent that the word grotesque has at last become only a name and is no longer a description as well. <clears throat> So this is the point at which my research has basically ended so far, because from this point forward, the foundries of all three of these countries, and now many others as well, embarked on a period of such chaotic cross-pollination that it becomes very difficult to pinpoint national styles anymore. 
type specimen books suddenly ballooned in size. And by the late 1880s, each founder is showing between 25 and 40 pages of sans serifs alone of every imaginable stripe. Uh, the various styles we've seen emerging here <clears throat> multiplied and proliferated to such an extent that it's easy to understand why they're viewed as anonymous. For the most part, they were still unnamed and they were often poorly organized. Um, and by this time, most founders were showing roughly the exact same mix of mismatched types, probably just to ensure that their offerings covered the whole range of possible styles. Um, I assume this is at least partly because the debut of mechanized typesetting in the mid 1880s brought with it the promise of redundancy for many founders and caused an intense scramble in the industry, causing each founder to try to be all things to all people in order to stay afloat. But what's clear is that by this point, the sans serif was here to stay. Uh, it was no longer relegated to the display section of type catalogs. Um, these often disparate collections of sans serif types were now given not only substantial showings, but also much more prominent placement in type specimen books, now often appearing before the slab serifs and clarendons that they had previously always followed. For me, leafing through these things for months and months, it became very palpable, the progression of where the, the sans serifs occurred in the sequence of the specimen books. So just to illustrate the intercontinental cross-pollination I was talking about, we're almost done. Um, I just find this really amusing. Here's a typical example. And believe it or not, this really is typical, more the rule than the exception at this stage. Um, this very handsome type specimen from the Chicago type foundry of Martyr Luz and Company is a perfect example. Among its various spreads of grotesque types, we can recognize <clears throat> styles from the American white foundry, Although I believe, to be fair, that Martyr Luce started as a branch of the white foundry, so we'll allow that. That's where this came from. But there are also other styles in this catalog which should now look very familiar. For instance, from the Dressler foundry of Frankfurt under Flinch and the Edinburgh foundry Miller and Richard. And I just included this page because I thought it was awesome. Um, if you read the sample text in the upper left, uh, home poets at the breakfast table, the tear of sensibility has sailed many clams tough steak and wheat coffee. Um, and also I thought it was kind of, I, I think a, an early incidence or from what I've seen of um, these big display small caps, which I thought were kind of cool. Um, and then presumably it was the recognition of this mounting status of the sans serif, as well as the total state of confusion of many sans serif families at this point that caused the major foundries, which were still standing in the late 1890s, to revisit, reorganize, and in several cases redraw the families now chaotically taking so much space up in their catalogs. So after the frenzied reorganization of the type industry that took place in these last couple decades, once the dust had settled, the first decade of the 20th century saw the creation of a series of major new sans serif families, which were a direct outgrowth of the faces of the 19th century. There was Berthold's Accidents Grotesque, this is actually the original spelling with a double C, um, which I believe attempted to unify a collection of disparate designs for its various weights in about 1896. Um, but you can still see the evidence of its different sources and the variation among those different weights today, which trickled into Helvetica as well. For instance, the presence of a tail on the lowercase a and lighter weights, but not in the bolder weights, although there are certainly practical reasons for a decision like this as well. Um, these are two of the more similar weights, the medium and bold. Uh, there's Shelter and Giesecke's Breite Grotesque, which became the unofficial typeface of the Bauhaus, and uh, which was beautifully revived earlier in this century uh, by Christian Schwartz of commercial type as F.F. Bau. Um, by the way, Breite just means wide. <clears throat> then there were Morris Fuller Benton's remarkable uh, Franklin alternate and news gothics from ATF in 1902 to 1908. And again, these really use the grotesque form <clears throat> as just a starting point to create something that, as I said earlier, to my eye, is almost a completely new genre unto itself, literally the American Gothic, and very much a 20th century style. And then much truer to the pure grotesque style, there was also Stempel's Reform Grotesque from 1904 to 1907, and Bauer's Venus, also in 1907. But for my final image, I wanted to leave you with this. Uh, it's a mock advertisement from Stempel's dedicated reform grotesque cursive specimen of 1910. So this is getting a specimen all to itself. Um, and it suggests reform grotesque as an ideal choice to characterize a classical music event and uses a classical centered layout to promote this essentially industrial age grotesque. So no longer an anonymous nameless list at the back of a catalog, uh, 
By this point, the grotesque has finally outgrown its status as a lowly jobbing face, only fit to shout in the voice of commerce, and is finally able to speak as the quiet, venerable voice of culture as well. Thank you. Everybody still awake?